Molto bene, grazie eh, professor Portier, grazie anche per essere stato perfettamente nei tempi. La parola adesso alla professoressa Kate Guiton dell'Agenzia Internazionale per la Ricerca sul Cancro dell'OMS. Prego, anche a lei 15 minuti. Good morning everyone, can you hear me? Thank you for the invitation to be here. I'm Kate Guyton. I'm the senior toxicologist in the IARC monographs program at the International Agency for Research on Cancer. We are a scientific organization. Uh, we are the official cancer agency of the World Health Organization. We're based in Lyon, France. I want to begin by stating that I have no financial interests related to the subject matter of my presentation. So, this is probably not news to anyone in this room, but IARC classified glyphosate as probably carcinogenic to humans. IARC evaluations are used as a reference worldwide. Uh, this is because they rely on data that are in the public domain for independent scientific review. This is essential for transparency. There are also these reviews are done by the world's leading experts without vested interests, and this is essential for independence. I do want to point out very clearly, IARC does not make policy recommendations. We are part of the World Health Organization, uh, and we serve a very broad community who may take different regulatory actions depending on our evaluations. So you might ask, how are these IARC monograph evaluations conducted. What if you had a big pile of papers such as shown at the top? How do you turn it into one of these orange covered books which are known as the IARC monographs? Um, and you can see the, the glyphosate uh, publication here uh, shown. Well, all of the answers to this question are given in this preamble. This is available online. You can access it right now and read it. It's about 25 pages long. It gives everything from the procedural guidelines for how we choose participants, how we manage conflicts of interest, engage with stakeholders, and conduct the meetings. It also gives the separate criteria that we have for reviewing the different lines of evidence from human studies, studies in experimental animals of cancer, and mechanistic evidence. And it, finally, it gives the decision process for overall evaluations. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about this procedure um, that we utilized and, and some of the ways that it's been impacted uh, since the glyphosate evaluation. So the first question is who does the evaluation? And this is done by a working group of independent scientists without conflict of interest. They have to complete a declaration of interest. Um, and these are the ones who are selected to review the science and develop the evaluations. They are the ones who write the evaluations and unfortunately nobody else. Um, I am part of the IARC secretariat. I coordinate all the aspects of the evaluation and I ensure that the evaluation is conducted according to the preamble that I just showed you. Our meetings are attended by others. We have a transparent process where we, we do allow visitors, um, and there's three categories of these. The first is the invited specialist. This is someone who may have relevant knowledge, but they also have disclosed a competing in interest. Secondly, we have representatives of governments and health agencies. These are always welcome to come and attend. Um, and thirdly, we have observers. These are typically from the industry. Um, they have to, dis to disclose who, uh, on whose behalf they are observing. So for the glyphosate evaluation, we had observers on behalf of Monsanto. We had observers on behalf of the European Crop Protection Association. We also had academics. Uh, some people are very interested in this process of how scientists make decisions, um, and we had some of those folks. But none of these individuals shown in gray draft any of the text, and they cannot contribute to the evaluation. They can be invited to speak at the meeting. They uh, will be given that opportunity, but not while the working group is taking its evaluation. Uh, they are there to observe. They are not there to interfere in any way 
with this process and they are only there in limited numbers. They are not there to uh, disrupt the process in any way. So the scientific process is formal. Uh, it's what we call structured expert judgment. So we have three lines of evidence and these are first evaluated individually using these definitions that are listed here. There's a second step when these are brought together in a very formal way. The numbers that are listed at the bottom of the slide show the number of, of agents that have been classified in each of these categories. And the first thing I want you to notice is that having done over a thousand evaluations, most of them fall into group three, which means not classifiable. So we looked at that evidence. There was a lot of interest in that agent. However, we were not able to make a classification uh, based on the evidence. Um, so you could wonder, well, how do, how do agents get into these higher categories, group one and group two? Well, the agents that are group one, the vast majority have sufficient evidence of cancer in humans. There's a smaller number that uh, because of mechanistic evidence, they cause genotoxicity, they cause other types of effects that we know human carcinogens do, they can end up in that highest category. So, but for other agents such as glyphosate, the, the evidence from cancer in humans is limited. And what's this, what this means is that there are positive signals, typically from multiple studies, um, and these cannot, these positive signals cannot be explained by other factors. At the same time, chance bias and confounding cannot be eliminated. So it's like there's a light that's on, but it cannot be completely attributed to, uh, to the agent. Sometimes resolved uh, through further study and sometimes not. What happens when you have limited evidence is you go automatically into group 2B. Now it's possible to go into group 2A if that evidence is, is really almost all the way leaning to sufficient. It's also possible to go to group 2A if you have sufficient evidence of cancer in experimental animals. So as I say, this is just an example, but this it's a very defined process of how we make these overall classifications. Once you reach that limited evidence in humans, you cannot get to group three, okay? You have to be in group 2B or 2A. So um, with the glyphosate monograph, this is a typical process we follow. I'm just gonna get into this example a little bit more. Um, as I mentioned, we have an open process and, and we follow a transparent published method. According to this method, we announce our uh, meetings one year in advance. Um, and here are the things that we do announce there. We have a call for data. We have a call for experts. We have a call for observers. Now Monsanto did provide data. They did suggest experts and they did uh, request observer status at the meeting. Uh, and we honored all of those requests. Now, about two months before the meeting, we announce all of the participants at the meeting, okay? So we tell, uh, tell on our website who is going to be in the room, who are they representing, are they an observer, and for whom, uh, and who our working group is. Um, so all of the people who come to the meeting, including Monsanto and all of the other observers, have access to the draft documents. Now these are draft and deliberative documents. Um, that, uh, that are fully debated uh, in the working group. Um, at the same time, they're open for, for everyone at the meeting to have access to. So after the meeting, we publish a scientific summary together with the working group in the Lancet Oncology. We have a press embargo up until that time, uh, which I will say was violated in the case of glyphosate, but never mind. Um, after the publication, we, uh, we did reach out to help agent, other health agencies uh, and provided our reference list so that they could see uh, what data we had specifically looked at. Um, we did uh, really accelerate the publication of the full monograph. We had a lot of requests for this to really uh, make sure everyone could clearly understand the rationale of the working group. Uh, and this is available for free download. Oops. I'm sorry. So I'm just going to very briefly talk about the science. I realize this is not a scientific body, but I just want to summarize. I'm a scientist and I work for a scientific organization. 
what the scientific process was. We conducted literature searches. We uh, engaged with governments. We tried to get as much information as we could into the public domain. We must rely on studies that are in the public domain. This is not a new issue that came up with glyphosate. This is part of our preamble that we are using since 2006. It was part of the prior preamble. You'll see discussion of this in the Lancet Oncology uh, Journal in 2003 with our former director uh, of the program and of the agency, Lorenzo Tomatis, who said the industry is trying to give us secret studies as long as we keep them secret. And we can't do that because it, it just goes to the transparency and the independence and it's just, it's not something that we can do as part of our mandate. So, uh, so that's our policy. We did use studies of cancer in animals that were in the public domain. Um, we also found a number of studies in humans, including uh, of occupational exposures, I will say, the studies of cancer in humans were exclusively of occupational exposures. These are farmers, these are forestry workers, there are other types of people exposed in their jobs. There were other studies of communities who had been exposed during spraying operations. Um, this is a very difficult situation where people are being uh, exposed involuntarily and there were some studies of DNA damage, not many, uh, but those did exist in those uh, types of studies. So in brief, uh, the, can the studies of cancer in humans, as I said, provided limited evidence. Uh, these were, uh, the most of the studies were, most of the cases really came from case control studies in different areas of the world. There is a large cohort study going on in two states in the United States, uh, which provided fewer cases. The working group also conducted a meta-analysis of all the studies. This uh, also showed increased risk that could not be explained by other factors. At the same time, chance bias and confounding could not be eliminated. Uh, the studies of cancer in, in rodents, um, as Professor Poitier mentioned, the IARC looked at only at a few of these studies. We are looking for positive signals uh, to get to sufficient evidence. If, if that does occur, it's not like we're looking for only positive. We review all the studies, positive and negative. We're looking for a replication of a positive signal. It's not just one independent, isolated finding that would get to sufficient evidence that has to be repeated. We use statistical tests to rule out uh, chance. As I mentioned, we did have some, uh, a number of studies on damage to DNA. Um, the studies in community residents, I think, are, were, if we had had more of those studies, that, that can be very, very significant to any IRC working group. Um, we had few of those studies, at the same time they were positive, and we had a number of other studies. Um, we did note that glyphosate is negative in bacteria. I think this is always challenging. We love to use that Ames test to really identify genotoxic agents, and when it's negative, uh, this, can, this can be difficult, because that's one of our key screening assays. So to just summarize our hazard evaluation, there was the limited evidence of cancer in humans, there was sufficient evidence of cancer in animals, and there was strong evidence for uh, mechanisms that we know to be associated with carcinogens. And overall, this led the working group to classify glyphosate in group 2A probably carcinogenic to humans. So uh, just in closing, I want to say we uh, have gotten the question many, many times, why did you evaluate glyphosate? Well, we have a process where we take public nominations for agents if you have something you want us to evaluate. According to our preamble, we evaluate agents that have evidence of human exposure. You can put a check next to that for glyphosate. Uh, and it, there also has to be some evidence of carcinogenicity um, and in order to look at that issue, we uh, realizing that, that manual selection of a pesticide is prone to bias, we undertook a systematic look, we probed uh, all the available public databases, and this picture from this paper, which you can download for free right now, uh, shows the results for two different classes of pesticides. The size of the node shows you the amount of studies, uh, and this is just showing the studies on cancer in humans and how close together they are is how chemically similar they are. 
Uh, so this was the approach, uh, and you can see in the three volumes that we did recently, volume 112, 113, 117, we evaluated actually most of the agents that you can probably read. You'll see DDT, uh, pentachlorophenol, lindane. These were some of the agents that we did evaluate recently, and this was a very helpful process to, to eliminate bias in, in, in making a selection of an agent to, to evaluate. So uh, just this is my last slide to show you we over the years have evaluated a number of pesticides. They uh, really are no different with most of them growing, going to group three, just as like many of the other agents that uh, we evaluated. But the process that I just showed you was helpful uh, in, in that many of our recent evaluations, given the time and effort it takes to do these evaluations, were were uh, led to evaluations into group 2B, 2A, or group 1. So I want to thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions uh, you may have about our evaluation. Bene.